Welcome to Hiraith, the home of modern Welsh politics. On Hiraith, we have talked to the candidates for First Minister, but they are not the only party leaders in Wales. In this episode, we talked to the leader of the Wales Green Party, Anthony Slaughter. Hi, Anthony. Thank you very much for coming to talk to us today. Very glad to be here. Thank you for the invitation. So the first question I wanted to ask really is, who is Anthony Slaughter? I think a lot of people have, I think it's the nature of our media really, a lot of people know who the Mark Drakefords, Andrew Arthur Davises and Adam Prices of the world are, but who, who are you and, and what got you into politics? It's a long process really, my entry into politics. I've always been politically engaged, politically active. I won't go into too much detail, but I grew up in, I did my high school years in apartheid South Africa, which was a real education in what power and politics is all about. And then moved to London, partly to avoid arms the call up. And my 20s were spent living in London, a very political life, but not part of political, involved in squatting and various sort of campaigns. It was the time of the miners' strike, I'll give my age away here, miners' strike, the poll tax campaigns, Section 28. So it was always very, very politically engaged and aware of the Green Party at the time. Whenever I could vote Green, I'd vote Green, but back in the 80s, 90s, that wasn't too often. I moved to Wales. 17 years ago now, and I got very involved in community activism and sort of transition town type activities and became chair of Gwilio Penarth Greening. So that involved things like planting community orchards, local food festivals, but also slightly getting more political with things like road safety campaigns, 2020, clean air campaigns. And it also brought me into contact with council because like a lot of people, I didn't really have that much experience of what councillors did or who councillors were. And it made me aware, a growing awareness of the need for different people in politics. If we were going to get rid of the stumbling blocks to change these things and create the world we wanted to, it needed different sorts of people to stand for election. So it was just coming up for almost 10 years ago, I first stood for a council election. I'd been a pretty, I'd been a Green Party member for about three, four years and pretty much dormant. We just happened to have a parliamentary by-election that year as well. So I was thrown in at the deep end and it just took off from there, and it's been a real privilege to be involved with the Green Party, the wider Green Party, and work with some inspiring people, some really dedicated people, which has just reinforced in me the need to get Greens elected, really, which is what drives me right now. How does it feel to be in charge of a national campaign? Do you ever feel like the weight and the pressure on your shoulders to, to, to get a good result? Yeah, it's always, and it's always to facing both ways as well. It's about managing the party, it's being responsible for the party, the candidates, the activists, the face that we put out to the public. It's something I enjoy, it's rewarding. I'm looking forward to celebrating our first elected Senate members in a few weeks' time. That will be the reward for all these years of work. You, you, you mentioned there that you, you, know, you haven't had a, a member of the Senate yet. I mean, you, you, you had Colonel Davis as a sort of joint Green Plaid MP, but the state of the party isn't always about the amount of elected representatives you've got. It's, a, it's about the health of the party overall. How would you describe the health of the Green Party in Wales as you approach this election? We're in a really good place right now. I went through, I was deputy leader several years ago at the time of the 2015-2016 Green Surge, when our membership was going through the roof and got local parties popping up all over Wales. And it's feeling a lot like that again. There was a bit of deflation after the last Senate elections and we lost some good people, but there's some really strong, active people, especially young people, coming on board and are standing as candidates. And what reassures me is they've got a long-term vision of where they want Wales Green Party to get to. So it's not just about this election. It feels, you know, we're a small party, we have a problem with resources that all small parties have. And in this system, you know, predominantly first past the post system is weighted so heavily against us. But it feels optimistic, it feels positive. And as I said, we've got some brilliant people coming through. I'm very confident about the future health of the party. So this opinion poll, opinion and not opinion, but I suppose mm. it is an opinion poll too, that was released this morning, uh, puts the Green Party as you know, fourth on the list. Are you annoyed that the media doesn't treat you as such, doesn't treat you as one of the major parties in Wales? Incredibly annoyed. It's all very, very selective. It's, for us, it's outrageous that abolish are invited to the main table, so to speak, and we're not. It's, and yeah, we've been leapfrogging the Lib Dems some time now. I'm not going to do the usual politicians thing and sort of pick the one poll that really works for us because but, but it's bit, there's a consistent pattern. We, we're level pegging and we're increasing and we're quite we are in the wider UK media and in England we are seen as the fourth party. Obviously we haven't had that level of electoral success here yet but it is very frustrating especially given what is being talked about at these debates now as well. To sit there and watch other parties talk about the climate emergency is deeply, deeply frustrating. And I think very unfair to the voters of Wales 
and the BBC have got their, their guidelines, how they try and choose who's, who gets on the programmes. But when you're not letting, when you've got an election that has an element of proportionality and they're still using first past the post measurements to decide who should be on, I think it is, it is damaging to Welsh democracy. You mentioned it a bit there. All the big political parties in Wales, and I'm not, not, calling, you a, I'm not calling you a small party, but all the part, pretty much all the parties in Wales put an emphasis on green issues and uh, at least purport to talk about green recovery. What, why should people vote green when all those issues are already at the forefront of all the policy platforms in Wales? And, and what is your strategy to sort of break through that fact? Because a lot of people will think of the Green Party, you know, you know in, in a former life, as being a, a pressure group to make other parties adopt these positions but what can what can you do to really make people vote green and get those people elected we are a political party we need to be really clear about that our aim is to get elected representation at every level of government we aren't a pressure group it's welcome to see other welcome to see other parties taking on board the uh, the agenda of the climate emergency quite often it's just well-meaning words we've been talking about this for a very very long time and actions speak longer than words welsh labor will say all the right things about the climate emergency and they will take tentative steps in the right direction and then they'll push for airport expansion the welsh conservatives will talk a good green talk even, even they're doing it now and then they'll talk they'll promise the m4 relief road back on the table the importance of getting greens elected and you see this wherever they are and you see the phenomenal work that caroline lucas does one woman and 600 odd mps and what she achieves and you see it when Greens get elected on council, you see it in the London Assembly. Our offer to the voters of Wales this time round is it's going to be a very uncertain outcome. No, it looks like no overall control. The next Welsh Government needs good scrutiny. We, we're in the last decades of tackling this problem in any meaningful way. So you need people who understand these issues holding the next Welsh Government. Because let's be honest, we're not going to be the next Welsh Government. But you need those Greens in the Senate holding the Welsh Government to the feet to the fire, making sure that these targets are met and the targets are ambitious enough. I mean, Welsh, Welsh Government, by their own admission, aren't meeting their targets for 2050, which we would already argue are insufficient and ambitious enough. So it's easy to talk green. It's a lot harder to deliver. And that's why our message is really simple. If people want green, then they need to vote green. You say you're not going to be the next Welsh Government. Is there any, you know, any circumstance in which you may agree to be part of a coalition government? This is a question that comes up a lot lately because yeah, it's all so unpredictable. And you know, I'm sure the Lib Dems six years ago never imagined that they were going to have a government minister as they went into that election. So we wouldn't rule anything out. You know, we've, got, we've got our programme that we want to put forward. And there's a lot of overlap with some of the other parties in some areas. We would be open to discussion. It'd be interesting to see what was offered, what, was, what sort of deal people were proposing. So. The only answer I can give now is we wouldn't rule anything out, but I can't commit to anything right now, neither. Would you have any red lines? Would you have any things that air in any of the major uh, parties' manifestos that you just couldn't agree to back? It would be anything, anything that runs contrary to the need for action on the climate emergency. And things like nuclear power are a red line for us. You know, the other parties sort of fudge that issue quite often. Nuclear power is a red line. Airport expansion, we couldn't be, we couldn't be part of a government that was pushing for airport expansion at a time of climate emergency. But then it's also that brings up what would the relationship be? We don't necessarily need to be in a formal agreement. It could be on an issue by issue basis that we move forward. Obviously, uh, you, you want Greens elected. Um, if they weren't, what would you like to see taken forward in the next Senate term? What action do politicians need to take on green issues and on the environment to ensure that the the, the Senate after this one isn't relocated from a, you know, a less floodplain likely building. We're going to get a very good result, I think. I'm fairly confident we're going to get our best result ever. So that will send a message to the next Welsh Government about these issues and the importance. But equally, I think there's an overarching thing that's really important and crucial for the next Senate, and that is this sort of stealth demolition of devolution. So all these things, I was on an XR hustings last night, and all everyone from, we're all agreeing, and everyone's agreeing on them. This needs to happen, that needs to happen. But the ability of the Welsh Government to actually even do those things could be gone. So I think post this election, all progressive, all progressive parties have to do everything to get everything in our power together to stop this post-Brexit power grab from Westminster, because that undermines everything that we need to do to tackle the climate emergency, to tackle social injustice. So I think that would be a high priority for the next Senate. 
you, you talk about defending devolution and we will talk a little bit about independence uh, in a bit, but I wanted to talk to you about your own sort of internal devolution. Obviously, we've had conversations before about why the Green Party took the decision it did in, in Wales not to become a separate Welsh Green Party. But I'm sure people would like to know a little bit about you know, how much clear green water there is really between yourselves as a, as a political party and uh, the other federal parts of your party. So in terms of policy making, was that a solely Welsh Green Party proposal? And was it worked on solely by the Wales Green Party? Absolutely. We have a policy committee and what we have is a overarching document, Policies for Sustainable Society in Wales. And that's our sort of guiding policy document. It's not the manifesto, but nothing can be in the manifesto that contradicts the policy document. And you probably know, I've probably said before, Wales Green Party, all Green Parties are grassroots democratic organisations. So policies made by members at conference, you know, it's not imposed top down. We had a big overhaul because, because of that process of doing it at an annual conference, things get a bit patchy, some things get outdated. So we had a big job of work last year when we overhauled the entire policy document and the policy committee met quite regularly. And that is purely Welsh members, Welsh members of different areas of expertise. The manifesto has then been drafted by members of the Wales Green Party. It's the first time the Green Party see it is when it goes public. We're obviously, having said that, we're on the same page on most issues. So it's it's always a tricky thing, and it's a tricky thing for other parties in the UK now, as devolution goes further down the line, when the UK party draws up its general election manifesto. And we have to put lots of disclaimers in the beginning of that, saying that we recognise that some things have been devolved to Scotland, some things have been devolved to Wales. This is our vision. And then at a devolved election, we've got much clearer territory to talk about what it is we would do, what we could do. But at the same time, it's also important I found in the manifesto process, because there's some stuff in our manifesto like UBI, which the Welsh government can't deliver. But you've got this balancing act of your manifesto is a program for government, what you would do with the levers available to a devolved administration. But you've also got to be offering to people where your destination is. And that, that leads quite nicely onto the independence question, really, because you come up against these things that we want to see in Wales and with the hostile Westminster government, they just can't happen in Wales. You did a perfect link for me. Thank you very much, Anthony. Yeah, obviously, we've, we've, we've had an episode of this pod before. We've talked to you and, and Emily Durant about, about your move to support independence. But I think I've heard a few, a few um, mumblings online uh, and in the, you know, the election literature I received through my own door. There's not a huge amount made of your move to independence. Was that a strategic decision to just focus on environmental issues uh, you know, prima facie, or, or, or is there some sort of reluctance to just put that on literature? I wouldn't say there's a reluctance. It's front and foremost of every media appearance I'm doing. It's something that we can't stress often enough because it was a very serious, very solid decision. It runs through the manifesto like writing Mystic of Rock. It's, it's there. It underlines everything we're proposing. With the literature, I think there's a delay, partly because we couldn't delete it in for a while. So mostly what's only gone out so far has been the regional free post leaflets. There's a need, as you've said, other parties are talking about green issues. We have to balance the fact because we sometimes get people complaining if a leaflet goes out that doesn't mention green issues. We have you know, people, people's expectation of us. We're getting to the stage now, you know, I'll be doing my own leaflet for my constituency. So different local parties will be doing more localized literature in the next coming weeks and canvassing. And I'm certain that several of them will focus quite heavily on independence. Let's talk a little bit about reform of the Senate. Obviously, the Green Party has always been in favour of more proportionality. If, if a Green was to be elected to the Senate, how would you envisage them approaching the question of Senate and electoral reform? Well, we definitely want a more proportional voting system. Multi-member constituencies, probably STV would be the ideal. We've always backed the McAllister report's recommendations, we've backed them since they came out, and that's going to make this election quite interesting because it's going to be quite a polarised election with all the ragtag groups on the other side who just shout to, to be abolished or shut down. We would work, that would be one area I think where there's a lot of ground, common ground for progressive parties to work together because it does need to be reformed. We do need a fairer voting system and we do need more Senate members. Are you at all concerned about the sort of future of the nation 
because I think a lot of the polls, apart from the one this morning, that was very good for yourselves, apart, lots of those polls have, have shown sort of quote unquote progressive parties falling short of that magic mark where they could reform the Senate. Are you at all concerned that, because let's be, let's be honest, a more proportional electoral system makes it easier mm-hmm. for Greens to be elected. Are you ever at all concerned about not only the, the future of Wales, but the future of the Green Party in Wales, if those moves aren't made? There's a real danger of democracy stagnating in Wales if we don't make this. And I think this challenge from UKIP and abolish and the like, I think that should actually be a call to action. But rather than what tends to happen with the mainstream parties is they get a bit nervous then and don't want to push for it. Something, the sort of thing we're seeing with Keir Starmer, just trying not to, not to scare the horses. But I think it actually underlines the need to make a strong, bold case. And it needs those parties working together to do that. And I think that underlines why we need more proportionality. That So working together and collaborating on common aims is the norm, not something that, you know, and that, that is what's holding us back. It's not just the fair voting system, it's the reluctance of the so-called big parties to even think that they've got to talk to other people to get these things done. Thinking about working together, you previously worked together with Plaid Cymru and the Liberal Democrats for Unite to Remain. Why is there no sort of similar arrangement in the Senate election, surely it would make it easier to get uh, Liberals and Greens elected on the list if there was some sort of arrangement between the parties. Well, no one's approached us. It's not on anyone's agenda. Labour are sort of just tribally completely opposed to it. You mentioned Unite to Remain. You know, Labour was supposed to be part of that. The difference, a different place Wales and the UK could be now if Labour had been part of Unite to Remain. It, it's deeply frustrating. What I find even more frustrating, something like the Senate elections, where there's a win-win situation for Labour. In the, in the South Wales regions, a Labour vote on the region list is a given, it's a waste. But we've seen thousands of them over the years that aren't going to achieve increased seats for the Labour Party. So they're, they're, it's, it's on a plate there. The Labour, Labour Party should be approaching us saying, we'd rather have you in the, part, in the Senate than abolish. What can we do to facilitate this? But it's just, it is deeply, deeply frustrating. And we're going to go into the 2024 general election with Labour probably refusing to acknowledge that they need to work with other parties. Obviously, the purpose of Unite to Remain was to stop Brexit. What is your party's position on that now? We want the closest possible relationship with Europe. And we think Wales needs it. I mean, at a minimum, we need the customs union and single market. Yeah, politicians are very nervous about talking. And it's the, the media has set the agenda and politicians are very t- nervous about talking about it. But we're seeing growing awareness. I mean, the COVID pandemic has actually acted as a bit of a cover for some of the worst impacts of Brexit as they start to happen. But a lot of people, a lot of industries, the fishing industry, farming industry, have realised what they've been sold. I, I, I often get asked this when we talk about independence. People say, do you see an independent Wales back in the EU? That might be my own personal feeling, but... They are two separate campaigns. They are two very, very separate issues. It would be, it's almost a two-step process. Get an independent Wales, and then that independent grown-up Wales can make its own mind up about its relationship with Europe. What do you think the voters' response will be to that? Do you think that there is the die-hard core group of people in Wales looking for a Remain party? Do you think there's any danger that some of your voters, that some of the people who did vote for you previously, will feel a bit let down by that position? I don't think so, because I haven't said, I've said we want the closest possible relationship with Europe, the customs union single market, which our, our businesses need. That was a strange campaign, but uh, our voters aren't usually single issue voters. They're, they're bigger picture people usually. Unfortunately, the Greens have not had a, a member of the Senate or an Assembly member to this point. But you've got Greens, well, if not in government, certainly helping the government in Scotland. They're likely to do very well hmm. in, in Germany. Do you think things like that will start to change the public perception of the Greens as a serious electoral option? Absolutely, it does. It's people see Greens in positions of power. People see elected Greens. They also see what those elected Greens achieve. We mentioned Caroline and the Scottish Greens have been doing some incredible stuff, and they're in, on the verge of a very exciting place right now, I think. But we've seen it across Europe against fairer voting systems, and Greens are in government in one shape or form well, part of government in one shape or form in eight European countries now. And we saw the phenomenal success in New Zealand with an electoral system fairly similar to Wales, but also in New Zealand, they made a breakthrough on constituency first past the post. It's, it's that getting the first Greens elected 
because I, I can guarantee you, if we get one Green elected to the Senate this time around, we'll get five next time. When people see the difference it makes. Let's talk about that difference. Let's talk about some of your your key top lines. With what you've got in the manifesto, how different would Wales be in five years if a Green was elected? We would be moving at pace. We would be tackling climate emergency far, far more seriously. And um, we've got our plans for Green Transformation Fund because we recognise and we talk about the 2030, 2050 targets. We recognise 2030 is what's needed. You come up again, we said earlier, barriers of a West hostile Westminster government. You come up against the barrier that Welsh government can only do certain things, which slows down that progress. That's why we're proposing the Green Transformation Fund for Wales, which would issue bonds to pay for the pay for the decarbonisation that's needed in energy generation, transport and housing. And it's a very exciting piece of work because it's something that can actually be done under the existing devolution settlement. So I think Greens in the Senate, that would be something, going back to talking to other parties, that would be something we'd want to see some serious movement on. We'd want to see a commitment to that because we really are running out of time to tackle this crisis. And I think the other thing difference it would make, politics would feel different. That was one of the big hopes at the start of the Senate, wasn't it? The beginning of devolution, that there was going to be politics done differently, the round room, and it was going to be collaboration, cooperation, and talking. And it's quite depressing that it's turned into the sort of Punch and Judy, Prime Minister's Question type atmosphere. So I think Greens in the room, grown-ups in the room, might bring the other parties back to their senses as well. Where do you think your best chance is to get a Green elected? I think well, it's, obviously, it's obviously on the regional list right now. The whole of South Wales is promising. Mid and West is promising. Strangely enough, the numbers, if you just do it on the numbers, the North looks quite good as well. So I think my position on this is we need to be pushing for that fourth list seat in all five regions. That's the way that we make sure next time we get up to five. Do you think that's likely or do you think it will just more likely be one or two? Realistically, this time it's probably one or two. But as I said, that would be the that would be the breakthrough, and I could definitely see that leading to five next time. We, you know, we've talked to all the other. Well, uh, we've talked to a significant amount of the other party leaders. But why should Welsh voters put their faith in you as a party leader and your party above all others? Because we've been speaking the truth for a very long time. We recognise the problems. We're a party that understands that social justice and climate justice and racial justice are all the same problem and all the same response. We're a party that's delivered when we've got elected in other assemblies, in other countries, we deliver. We're a party that you can trust to do what it said it will do. So Anthony, if people want to find you on Twitter and hear more of what you've got to say, where should they go? On Twitter, it's AS underscore Panath and also at Wales Green Party. Anthony Stoughter, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Hiraith. If you like what you heard, please don't forget to subscribe, rate and review.